Good evening. Tonight we're in Acts chapter 8 and we'll talk about Simon the sorcerer. And that encounter begins about verse 9. Simon uh, is a magician and uh, he comes to uh, become a, a Christian, a brother, and, uh, a brother of, of yours and mine. Uh, but what we're not going to talk about, we'll go ahead and get it out of the way, is we're not going to talk about magic uh, a whole lot. Um, we can talk about that uh, if you'd like in depth. And it's my opinion that you can point to several scriptures and say that magic was more than parlor tricks, that it was full on something that was happening. Uh, but we're not going to really get into in-depth uh, analysis of magic and its use in the scriptures. Sorcery is condemned in the Old Testament uh, by God, and here this individual is a sorcerer. In Acts chapter 8, starting in verse 9, there was a man named Simon who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is a man of, uh, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic but when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip, and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. So who is Simon? It says that they paid attention to him and says in verse 10, this man is the power of God that is called great. Well, what does that mean? Well, Justin Martyr, who was, uh, you know, 80 or 100 years after uh, this incident took place, writes about, about Simon. In uh, the Apologies of Justin Martyr, Apology number 26, an excerpt from there says, uh, let me explain apologies. Justin is writing to Rome. He is writing to the Roman Senate and he is trying to tell them about the power of God and who Christians are and why they should stop killing Christians and what Christians believe. So this is Justin writing to the Roman Senate. And he says, there was a Samaritan, Simon, a native of the village of Gitto, who in the reign of Claudius Caesar and in your royal city of Rome did mighty acts of magic by virtue of the art of devils operating in him. He was considered a god and as a god was honored by you with a statue. The statue was erected on the river Tiber between two bridges and bore the inscription in the language of Rome, Simone de Sanctus, meaning to Simon the holy god. And he, by the aid of devils, has caused many of every nation to speak blasphemies and to deny that God is the maker of universe and to assert that some other being greater than he has done greater works. This is an apology of Justin Martyr, or it's actually just a little bit of it. And what it talks about here is, you know this guy, Simon, and he performed great works in front of Rome, so much so that they called him Holy God, and they built a statue to him. In Apology 56, speaking of Simon, Justin writes, Simon was in the royal city Rome in the reign of Claudius Caesar, and so greatly astonished the sacred senate, that is the Roman senate, and the people of the Romans, that he was considered a god and honored like others, whom you honor as gods with a statue. Wherefore, we pray that the sacred senate and your people may, along with yourselves, be arbiters of our memorial, and if that anyone be entangled by that man's doctrines, he may learn the truth and be able to escape error. As for the statue, if you please, destroy it. I love that that little addition there by, by Justin. By the way, he's got a statue. If you don't mind, go ahead and tear that thing down. That'd be great. Um, so who is Simon? Simon is known by the Romans. He's known by the Samaritans, which is the city that they're in. He is known as being a very powerful 
individual, someone who is able to work mighty works. And he is considered by many, even the Roman Senate, to be a god. This isn't a small fish. This is one of the major people that you might want to convince to be a Christian. He is a, a, a substantial obstacle in the way of people seeing who God is and coming to trust in God, so much so that in your Bible, back to uh, Acts chapter 8, the man is the power of God that is called great. This is who your Bible says Simon is. Simon's doing mighty things by the power of, of demons, or at least by the power of evil, because this is how he is being recognized. He is setting himself up to be greater than the God of uh, the greater than God in this world. So we come to our first point. No one's greater than God. There is nothing greater than the creator of the universe. And anyone who would step up and say different is wrong and is subject to the judgment of the creator of this universe. No power of hell or scheme of man will stand against our God. But power itself plays a large role in this section of scripture. And Satan has brought to the table one Simon, a sorcerer, who he has imbued with great power. And power is something that you should look for when you're reading through chapter 8 because it's where people are looking and it's where works are being done, and that's what has people's attention. Simon comes to believe the greater power, the things that Philip is doing, and in verse 12, he comes to believe, know, understand, and agree that God is more powerful, and in verse 13, he continues with Philip after seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Your scriptures, uh, your Bible may say great miracles. It may also see works of power. The raw Greek says works of power after seeing signs and works of power. He was amazed. The apostles come down to give the Holy Spirit, to, to increase the amount of power and uh, share it with the people there in Samaria. Verse 14, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit, for he had not yet fallen on any of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When they laid their hands on them, they received the Holy Spirit. So this is what we would look to as how the power of the Holy Spirit or the gifts of the Holy Spirit are transferred from one person to another. There are many denominations throughout the world who say that they have the ability to work miracles, that they can do uh, specific or certain things by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we see here that as Philip had the power of the Holy Spirit and whatever works that he was doing that were seen as works of power, Philip didn't have the ability to convey this to anyone else so that they could also do works of power, but Philip could. So the apostles come down to, uh, from Jerusalem to Samaria. Peter and John come and they pray and by laying on of hands and prayer, they are given the ability to, uh, to have someone else use the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And so whenever we look at how did the gifts of the Holy Spirit die out, well, when the apostles died, then there were no more apostles' hands to be put on anyone. So eventually, as the apostles die, nobody else can receive these gifts of the Holy Spirit. And after those people who have those gifts die off, because they can't transfer them to anyone else, you have a cessation there of the works of the Holy Spirit, as we have recorded. 
or that we have recorded for us. Doesn't stop God's providence. It doesn't limit God's power. But now the scriptures are written down and they are spread out abroad through epistles and through the Bible, like you're either looking at on your telephone or that you're looking at in, in paper form in front of you. We don't need those works of power to show us uh, that God is in control. We don't need works of power to confirm for us that God's word is true. Actually, our ability to hold that word of God in our own hands, having a document that has not changed in 2,000 years, is a work of God all by itself. But this is how that gift of the Holy Spirit is transferred. Receivers could not give away that power again. Philip already was there and he couldn't do it. And so you need the apostles to do it. When Simon sees that, that's what he wants. Verse 18. Now when Simon saw that the spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. We need to understand what he's asking for here. Simon wants to have more power than Philip. Philip couldn't do that. Philip could do that. Peter and John can stay up in Jerusalem doing what they need to do there, ministering to the church and confirming the word of God and taking care of the thousands of Christians that are in the city of Jerusalem. What he's asking for, what Simon is asking for, is the ability to give the Holy Spirit in verse 19 uh, so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. He wants to be an apostle. He wants to have the power that the apostles have. He wanted to be greater than someone else. Isn't that natural though? He has already given up being somebody great. Simon is used to being someone great. The Roman Senate built him a statue and called him a holy God. He's used to being somebody great. And what he says is, look, guys, I'm on par with you. You need to go ahead and give me the power to be on par with you. I'm, I'm used to being a holy God. I can handle that. Here, I'll pay you. This is the depth of where Simon is. I want that power. The response Peter gives, we read from in verse 20. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter for your heart is not right before God. Simon's heart is not right before God. We have the ability to judge other people's hearts and we should not try. It's a folly and foolish thing for us to try to do. But here, by the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter is able to assess Simon's heart and says, your heart is not right. What does that mean? It means his focus is power. That's what he offers them uh, back, why he offers them back up in verse 18, money. But what about Peter and John and their assessment of money? When we were in chapter three, we saw what Peter and John thought about money. I sang it. I was right over there and saying for you, silver and gold have I none. But such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. It was more valuable to have the power of God. It was beyond the measure of money or restitution or ability to pay. The name of Jesus is more powerful than any financial force in this world. Simon's focus still just wasn't quite right. And so he's not looking at what God can do. He's looking at what he can do. So I ask you to, to check your focus tonight. It's not about what you can do as a Christian. It's about what God can do at, with you because you're a Christian. You're not powerful enough to save the world, but the word of God is. You're not powerful enough to be perfect, but the word of God is powerful enough to make you perfect. And it's not your power that you trust in or that you stand in. It's not your strength. 
that you need to be reliant on. It's not your ability to be somebody great. It's God's ability to show his greatness through you. Actually, after this morning's message of looking at how God brought one of his greatest servants low, I think it would be appropriate to wonder if some people are held back in certain ways physically or they have certain talents or gifts not given to them because they would be too awesome if they had full strength or full capacity. Perhaps it is the limitation of our power, our ability to do, that shows most God's great power. May God help us focus on what he can do because of what we can't. We also see here that Simon hasn't left everything behind yet. Simon still has love for the world. He still has focus on the things of the world. And so the next power that we look at is the power of repentance. The power to repent is what God calls all of Israel to do. The power to repent or, or the need, the necessity of repentance is what John the Immerser calls on Israel to do. The need to repent is what Jesus calls on Israel to do. And in Acts chapter 17 and verse 30, as we mentioned this morning, it's what the apostles tell us that God still wants everyone to do, to repent and to come to him, to take the things of your heart and set them aside and look to God and have a heart like his. And what there's told to Simon, starting in verse 22, is repent therefore of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. Repent. Now, who is this? This is a Christian. We read verses back that Simon was baptized too, that he is following Philip, that he is learning and he is he's watching the power of God confirm the word of God. He has abdicated his heart to God and no longer claiming that he's a God or working the power of God. But something's not perfect yet. Something's not right yet. If you are waiting to become a Christian until you have straightened your life out, you're not even following Simon's example. Simon's not perfect. Simon hasn't got it all figured out, but you know what he is? He is a Christian. He has been baptized, and does that make him perfect? Absolutely not. But he also recognizes that he stepped out of line as a Christian, and he needs forgiveness. Repentance is the prescription that Simon is given because as a Christian, he has made a mistake. This is said often that I need to get my life right and then I'll be back to church. I need to get my life right and then I'll become a Christian. You got it all wrong. You become a Christian and then ask God to help you get your life right. You become a Christian and you accept the free gift of God of salvation and then you work every day on trying to be the person that he wants you to be. Perfect people are not saved. Saved people are made perfect. So start your journey of salvation right now and don't wait until you're worthy because you'll never be worthy. None of us are. But you know what Christians are? They're saved. You'll never make it on your own. So what is said here, what response Simon gives when he is told you were wrong, you have done wrong, your heart is wrong. Simon, to his credit, oh, our great brother Simon says, Pray for me, in verse 24, pray for me to the Lord 
that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. Pray for me to the Lord. Do you know what kind of humility that's going to take from a man who, you know, a couple of days ago, people were calling a God. And now he is asking someone else to ask the true God to make him right, to fix him, to fix his heart. Because he knows he's wrong. And he knows the power of the creator of the universe is stronger than anything. He has, He's headed in the right direction. And while his heart is not right, and you can say that because Peter tells us by the Holy Spirit that Simon's heart's not right, you can also see in Simon's character that he wants to be. He wants to be right. He wants to get it right. He wants to be saved. He wants to receive this power. He wants to go to heaven. He wants to be right with the creator of the universe. But right now, he's a pretty filthy guy who has a dirty heart. If you're not a Christian, maybe that's your assessment of what your life is right now. A pretty dirty life. And you wonder about your heart. And you wonder about your conscience and your standing before God. Again, perfect people aren't saved. Saved people are made perfect. And so Simon calls on the power of prayer. Verse 24, again, pray for me to the Lord that nothing of what you say may come upon me. What does Simon know of prayer? He had people praying to him, possibly, just a couple of days before this. What does he know of the prayer that the apostles will be praying? So Simon saw it. He saw that God listens to prayers. Let's go back to verse 14. Now when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them. Okay, so this is some of the first prayers that that Simon is seeing. We're in the middle of verse 15, that they might receive the Holy Spirit for he had not fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of hands, he offered the money. It wasn't just the laying on of hands, it was the praying. They prayed and they laid on hands. So what they're mentioning here is the second one because that's what happened. He sees that Peter and John pray and God listens. The purpose of Peter and John coming down to Samaria was to impart that gift of the Holy Spirit. They speak to God. They lay their hands on these people. And God obviously has listened because it's impactful. Simon sees it. He sees God listens to prayers. And so there's another lesson from our dear brother Simon that we should follow. God listens to prayers. And as a Christian whose heart is wrong, this is what he calls out for in verse 24. Pray to God for me. Pray for me to the Lord specifically. You need to be forgiven. Repent. That's the very first order of action. Peter says, repent. Repent. Something's wrong with your heart. Something's wrong with your conscience. Something's wrong with your life. Repent and get things back in the proper order. Step two, pray. We're told in James to call for the elders and to have them pray over you. Is anyone among you sick, let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. I want to repeat that. I want to jump up and down. Can we just sing that in a round, in, in chorus? He will be forgiven. You will be forgiven. If you have the elders pray for you, you will be forgiven. God listens to prayer and he is willing and able to pour out his great power to forgive on those who come to him having repented and having been prayed for 
the Christian that is. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power and is working. If you can't get a hold of the elders or if you are ashamed for whatever reason to talk to them, please don't be. They're very easy to talk to. But if you have another brother or sister that is so convenient that you've been working with, have them pray for you and pray for them. Confess your sins to one another and let each other know, how can I pray for you to the Lord if you don't tell me what you need? I want to pray for you. I want to help. Not that I can do anything, but I can call on God who has the power to forgive all sins, who's waiting for his Christians to return to him To repent. Let me get break the ice for you. I need prayers. I need help. I'm not perfect. My wife and my children can absolutely attest for you that I'm not perfect. Working on it. They'll also tell you how slow that progress is sometimes. And maybe yours is too. Pray for the Lord, or pray for me to the Lord that my heart not get stuck in the gall of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. We have to work with each other, for each other, and work to God, asking for his salvation. Do you need prayers? If you do, don't leave here tonight without them. We'll stop this whole procession of cars. No one whose heart is trying to be like the heart of God wants anyone to go without forgiveness and to see someone repent, try to get their heart right so that they can be saved by God. That is our goal. And that's what we're after. And if you need to be forgiven, do not leave here tonight until you are. The last power that we're talking about is the power of confirmation. The apostles came to give the Spirit. Peter and John come down from Jerusalem to Samaria to empower the confirmation of the Word. Philip's already there preaching the Word. There are people there who are listening to the Word of God. They are being saved. They are being immersed in water to the salvation of their souls. They know what God has to say because they are getting that from this preacher named Philip. What they are not getting is confirmation that the word that Philip is preaching is the power of God to save. So the power of confirmation is what Peter and John are coming to give. And as I spoke of earlier, this word of God that you have in your hands or on your phone or on your computer, this ability to pull up book, chapter, and verse and read exactly what the apostles wrote down, even in a different language, is God's power to save People are drawn to see the confirmation of the word, mighty works being done. And people will be drawn to seeing the word of God working in you. No, not that you're a magician and not that you can do magical things, but that the word of God has cleansed your soul and made you whole, saved person being made perfect. People will be drawn to seeing the confirmation of the word working in you. For that to happen, you must be working the works of him who sent you. You must be working the word of God in your life. For anyone else to see it, you must say it. You must show them that you're a Christian, that God has saved your soul. That you got to get it to them. And they will be drawn to that just as you were and just as you are. Speak God's word in your life daily and let others see the power of God to save. All of this power is given for the Christians. All of this is written for those who have been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus as we started back up in uh, earlier in Acts chapter 8. 
the word of God was preached to them. Verse 11, and they paid attention to him because for a long time, uh, no, not eight, um, chapter eight, verse 12. But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. This starts their Christian journey. This is the salvation that your soul has been prescribed. If you need to receive that, we can do that this evening, this very night before you go home. Most of you here are Christians. And so the word given to you is the one that Peter gives to your brother, Simon. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that if possible, your heart might be forgiven you. If possible, with God, all things are possible and he will he will forgive you of your sins. The if possible, it speaks of your willingness. Are you willing to repent? Are you willing to receive the salvation, the forgiveness of God? Then it is possible. If you need to be forgiven, make it known before you leave this place tonight.